Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. This week, were the UCI right to ban the Super Tuck? We speak to the pros and get your views on that too. We'll also look back at more road racing with the Etoile de Bessege and the Australian National Championships, the incredible power numbers of Filippo Ganna, the incredible running speed of Tom Pidcock, and look at the routes for Terreno Adriatico and the Giro d'Italia Grande Partenza. This week in the world of racing, we learned that every bike exchange rider from the Australian National Championships got free drinks last night, courtesy of Cam Meyer. Oh my god! Every drink is on me tonight. Holy s! <laughs> oh my god! Great stuff. Uh, the Aussie defended his title despite it looking against all the odds deep into the race. More on that coming later on. We also learned that Filippo Ganna averaged 488 watts for 12 minutes and 27 seconds en route to victory on stage four of the Etoile de Bessege. That was according to his Strava file. That guy is a beast. And finally this week, we learned that we will no longer be seeing this position in World Tour level road races. That's right, the UCI have banned the Super Tuck, made common by Matti Mohoric and made famous by Chris Froome en route to Tour de France stage victory back in 2016. So riders will initially get a warning if seen doing it, but then from April they will receive a fine. Now that ruling is amongst a number of new measures brought in by the UCI to try and improve rider safety, measures which I'll talk about shortly, but first let's get a couple of the pros reactions to the end of the Super Tuck. Yeah, I think obviously there's bigger concerns than, than just the position of riders on their bikes, uh, you know, with, with finish safety and barriers and stuff like this that need to be addressed before, uh, before we're too concerned about how we descend on the bikes. But uh, yeah, you know, if there's an accident that happens because of descending like this, then yeah, maybe it's a problem. But at the moment, you know, it's uh, riders are pretty safe in the descents and uh, it hasn't been a problem so far. So. Yeah, for sure we need some more safety in the race, but yeah, we, I think that also the UCI has to speak with us that we can say what we have to change and there was no contact with us and then we don't know about the rules and yeah, we will see what they changed and then we can see if it's good or not. Interesting stuff. Uh, now from what I read on social media, it seemed that most pro riders were against the decision, including Michal Kwiatkowski who posted this to Twitter. Which is an interesting take from my point of view because so many of the crashes that we see are down to rider error, generally in either overcooking things on a corner or elsewhere, or touching wheels within the peloton or your group. Now many pros also seem to claim that they hadn't been consulted despite the UCI claiming that the decision had been made in consultation with the riders. And this, I think, is yet another example of the officially recognised riders union, the CPA, simply not working really as it should be. Although on the flip side of that, both Philippe Gilbert and Matteo Trentin have voiced their frustration at fellow pros not taking an active role in committee meetings and such like, and only complaining when a final decision is made that they don't particularly like. Now, we've also been getting your views on this matter over on the GCN app, and it's quite a tight one. So 52% of you think that this is a good decision by the UCI, whilst 47% think the pro should have been left to themselves to decide. Now, don't ask me what happened to the other 1%. Anyway, my take? Well, I think that the UCI's decision is a good one on this. I know that no major crashes have resulted from the adoption of the super tuck position, but the UCI have been so often criticised for not taking action until there's been a major incident. So I don't think we should criticise them for taking action before any major incident has occurred. Yes, the pros are skilled. Yes, they are adults who can make their own decisions, of course, but I just don't see the need to take this kind of risk. Also, I absolutely hate seeing amateur riders do it out on the open road, and particularly young riders as well. I mean, it's true that we don't necessarily go out and copy the speeds of Formula One drivers because we watch them do it on our television screens. I mean, for me, that's partly because my Skoda Super doesn't quite go that fast. But nevertheless, I have seen a lot of people employ the Super Tuck on rides on open roads, and I always wince and just keep my fingers crossed. I probably shouldn't do whilst riding a bike down a hill, but nevertheless. Uh, your view may differ on this though, so please feel free to agree or disagree in the comments section below this video. Now, it was the Super Tuck ban that has hit the headlines most, including our own now, of course, uh, but it was not the only new safety measure implemented by the UCI. Far from it. 
in fact. Now the one that is at the forefront of most of our minds is the matter of barriers, which could have prevented the seriousness of Fabio Jakobsen's injuries had they not collapsed at the Tour of Poland last year. On that front, there will be new barrier standards implemented by the UCI in 2022 after they've consulted with the sport's key stakeholders. But before then, so through this year, they will already be putting rules in place regarding their positioning and weighting. Races will also now have a requirement to have an event safety manager and the UCI themselves have hired an overall safety manager who used to work at the Tour de Romandie. Beyond that, they are going to be looking into equipment in detail and at bottle cage designed specifically to try and prevent so many rogue bidons ending up in the road and in the middle of the peloton. That is of course how Geraint Thomas crashed last year at the Giro d'Italia, fracturing his pelvis. Riders are also going to be fined if they don't discard a bidon in an appropriate manner. So they are doing something, many things in fact, at the UCI to try and improve the safety of the sport. But as ever, there will always be more things that can and probably should be done. I for one though, think it's great that the UCI are taking some serious action for the safety of the riders. Right, I'm now going to move on to what's coming up on GCN Plus. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, Race Pass is now a part of GCN Plus, so all current Race Pass subscribers will automatically be upgraded and will now receive the documentaries and films which will start this time next week. Uh, so there's going to be over 100 films released in the next 12 months, but amongst the 24 that will be out on the 15th of February is a definitive story of the Covid hit 2020 cycling season. So here is a quick teaser for you. 2020, a year that changed all of our lives. The COVID-19 pandemic cast its shadow over the world, spreading faster and wider than anyone could have imagined and leaving devastation in its wake. Life as we knew it ground to a halt. The sports and entertainment industries decimated. Professional cycling was suspended mid-season. There were four positive cases among staff members on teams. One rider had tested positive. It was a pretty scary experience. It felt like the window was closing on cycling, sport and, and life. And we are watching possibly our last bike race for quite a while. We can't imagine a year without cycling. Immediately, everybody understood that it was key for cycling to work together. The tour needs to happen to save our sport. Is there a risk of catching COVID? Yes, there was, but at least we got to try it. This film tells the story of how the sport's movers and shakers came together like never before to deliver a race calendar like no other. There was always this uncertainty. Was it actually going to start or wasn't it? It was anything from like, this is not possible, we cannot race at all, to like, how do we make it happen? It was actually a unique phase in the history of cycling. You will hear from the president of the UCI, from the top race organizers, team bosses and doctors, from commentators, journalists and from the pro riders themselves. People are struggling, um, losing their jobs, losing hope. We will never take for granted being free again. That's professional sport, isn't it? It's, uh, you know, it's not a right that just because we're good at it that we get to continue doing it. This is the definitive story of pro cycling and COVID-19 in 2020. The story of a lost year saved. It's a great film, that one, so I'm very much looking forward to you all being able to watch it. What you'll already be able to watch this week is the Tour de la Provence, which is a four-day race in southern France where the likes of Alaphilippe, Mas, Vlasov, Wellens, Bilbao, Trentin, Bernal, Asgrain, Demarc, Vyatkovsky, Christophe, Lutsenko, Degenkolb, Molomar, Gilbert, and many, many more stars will be competing. So that is a must-see. And the good news is that we've got it all on GCN Plus in all territories, except for New Zealand, China, Japan, Denmark, and France. And I'll be commentating along with Matt Stevens, so make sure that you don't miss it. So also, if you haven't already signed up for GCN Plus, what are you waiting for? Uh, don't forget our early bird offer is open throughout the whole of February and it's 50% off the normal price, which means you'll get all the racing available where you are, plus all the films and documentaries for just £20 or €20 Euros or $25. I mean, that really is a bargain. But I'm going to stop the sales pitch now and move on to the Australian National Championships, which took place on the familiar circuit in Buninyong and Ballarat. Now, if you haven't already watched them, and you would like to, they are all available on GCN+, so if you'd rather not hear the results, 
Mute Me Now. So the week kicked off with the individual time trials, and I think it's fair to say that both the men's and women's events there were won by future superstars of the sport. Sarah Gigante is a name we've become familiar with at the Aussie Nationals over the past few years. She burst on the scene back in 2019 by winning the road race in the elites as a rider that just turned 18 years of age. She's now 20 and she took victory in the time trial for the second successive year. Meanwhile, in the men's, in the absence of Rowan Dennis, Luke Durbridge was the favourite in that race, but in the end, he was convincingly beaten by Luke Plapp. Now, that is a name that might not be familiar to all of you, but it probably will be soon. Uh, Plapp recently hit the headlines when he kept up with Richie Port up Willunga Hill at the Santos Festival of Cycling. Uh, that was a couple of weeks back now. And his win in the time trial was a convincing one. 43 seconds in front of the defending champion Durbridge. A 20-year-old is concentrating on the Olympic track events running up to Tokyo this year, but once he starts concentrating on road racing, watch out cycling world. Now he did in fact start as the favourite in the road race a few days later, and for a while he was looking good to pull off the double. However, youthful exuberance had gotten the better of him, and it was the more experienced riders who shone in the end. Team Bike Exchange may not have had the strength in numbers that they are used to at the Australian Nationals, but despite being on the back foot for much of the day, they somehow managed to pull it off. Here are the final few hundred metres commentated by Matt Keenan. Kel O'Brien in the day-long breakaway. Nick White, the local hero, is chasing. The gap has opened up. Cal is killing them in Buninyong. He looks over the shoulder. It is Meyer who is still coming. You can almost feel the cramp for Cal O'Brien. He actually stopped pedaling. He is cramping. O'Brien is cramping. Meyer, Bowden, photo. Cam Meyer. Bowden in second, cramp in third. Cal O'Brien. Unbelievable. Great stuff. Uh, Durbridge, they're the ultimate teammate, setting up Cam Meyer for the win. Uh, Meyer waited over a decade to take his first win at the National Road Challenge, which came last year. Now he's got two in the space of just over a year. Uh, Kelland O'Brien and Scott Bowden finished second and third respectively, whilst in fourth it was Nick White. And if that name rings a bell, it's because he was one of the three finalists at one of the first Men's Zwift Academies, which we had on the channel back in 2017. So fantastic to see him continue to progress so well. In the women's race, Team Bike Exchange also ran out winners. Uh, Sarah Roy formed part of an early move that went on the very first lap. By the time she rode over the finished line with the bell ring signifying one lap remaining, she was already solo with quite a significant advantage. And so, despite the efforts of those riding behind her, she wouldn't be caught, and things couldn't really have got better for her team either, with Grace Brown taking the silver medal in second spot, whilst in third, it was Loretta Hansen of Trek Segafredo. Right, let's move on now to the Etoile de Bessege, which unfortunately we didn't have on GCN+. But nevertheless, it was fantastic to finally have an early season European stage race taking place, wasn't it? And some great racing there was at that. Uh, so Christophe Laporte got Cofidis after the best possible season start, with a very impressive win on stage one. Timothy Dupont took the sprint win the next day after a rather messy run into the finish. But the general classification was pretty much done and dusted by the end of stage three. So there, we had an incredibly strong break, which stayed clear. Definitely the strongest ever to be at the Etoile de Bessege, I would imagine. Uh, but riding home solo in front of all of them was Tim Wellens. I mean, it was kind of inevitable really, wasn't it? That guy rarely gets beyond mid-February without a big win, and this year seems to be no different. And in fact, it was in the end two wins, because he and his Lotto Soudal teammates would go on to successfully defend that leader's jersey through to the end of the race. Now another rider and team who came away from the Etoile de Bessege with two wins were Filippo Ganna and Team Ineos. The big Italian was part of the early break on the penultimate stage of the race, but when it looked like they might get caught by the bunch behind, he went on the attack, in the saddle, Cancellara style, and nobody ever saw him again until after the finish line. Now, I know we're almost used to seeing huge numbers from Filippo Ganna, but seeing them still makes me gasp. So it was 12 minutes and 27 seconds from the moment that he attacked his breakaway companions to the moment that he crossed the line, and for that duration, he averaged 488 watts. But the first seven minutes of that effort, he averaged 509 watts. 
absolutely bonkers. I mean, that man is going to achieve so much in the sport beyond just time trialling, which up to that point accounted for nine of his 11 pro wins. I guess then it was almost inevitable that he'd go on to win the final day's time trial yesterday, making it 10 of 12 at this point. What an absolute machine. We'll move on now to RCS, who last week revealed the route of Strada Bianca, Torino Adriatico and the start of the Giro d'Italia, and we'll start with that one. Uh, so for the third time in the race's history, Turin will host a start, and it's a stage that is perfectly suited to Ghana actually, being a flat 9km individual time trial. From there, stage two will take them from Stupingi to Novara on a day that looks like it will be for the sprinters, while stage three is 187 kilometers to Canale, and one that already has a few lumps and bumps along the way, although probably not quite enough to see any gaps amongst the GC riders. Uh, the rest of the route will be revealed in about a week's time, so we'll get to see which of the high mountains are included then. Now, Team Ineos have, in fact, already decided who will lead their team at the Giro d'Italia this year, so long as illness or injury doesn't interfere. So, whilst Theo Gegenhart will not be there to defend his title, Ghana is going to be back, as you'd expect, and he will have Egan Bernal, Pavel Sivakov, and Danny Martinez for company, which is not a bad lineup, is it? Even before you add in the final four riders for the team. However, despite the strength of their Giro roster, it does not mean that they'll be any weaker for the Tour de France, because Geraint Thomas, Richard Carapaz, and Terry Gegenhart will lead the team there, whilst it will be Adam Yates and Tom Pidcock who'll be at the World Vuelta Espana at the end of the season. Now, speaking of Tom Pidcock, yesterday he posted a picture of himself running on Instagram, claiming that he'd set out to break 15 minutes of five kilometers, and then claiming that he'd covered that distance in just 13 minutes and 25 seconds, which isn't far off the British record. Cue lots of disbelievers in the comments who claim that his GPS was inaccurate and that there's no way he was running that fast. I mean, I've never managed to go sub 18 personally, so, well, maybe he did run that fast. Uh, anyway, he has vowed to back it up and to verify that time, and I should be watching that with great intrigue, because today I am starting a nine-week training program building up to a half marathon with help from the Global Triathlon Network. Yes, I've gone to the dark side. However, if you would like to join me on that dark side, you are very much welcome. I have just six kilometers to do today, so I'll put a link to the video and to the training plan in the description below this video. That way, even if you don't join me, you can at least take the piss out of my running style and the fact that I've got no muscles. Right, we should probably get back to cycling and to racing at this point, shouldn't we? So I'll move on to Terreno Adriatico. Now, the seven-day race, of course, starts near the Mediterranean coast and then spans Italy, arriving on the Adriatic coast, crossing five regions of the country along the way. Now, as was planned last year, the first stage is going to be on the road, as opposed to the team time trial, which the race has opened with for the last few years. Now, the first major shake-up of the race is likely to come on stage four, because that finishes up the Prato di Tivo. Uh, that very climb featured in 2012 and 2013, and was won by Vincenzo Nibli and Chris Froome, respectively. Now, it's the following day, though, that I am most looking forward to, because it's been called the Wall Stage. Uh, so it basically goes up and down the Muri, which litter the Ancona region. They are brutally steep, and there are a lot of them in that region. Uh, stage six, then, is another one for the sprinters, and then we will have the traditional 11 kilometer individual time trial on the seafront of San Benedetto del Tronto, which will finish things off on the final day. I so hope that all this racing can go ahead, don't you? Now, there was some good news as well for the Grand Tours and the Pro Continental teams last week, as the UCI granted them permission to grant an extra wildcard place. Uh, Alpes and Fenix won the right to enter all three Grand Tours with their performances last year, and accepting that chance meant there were only two spots left for the local teams. That, though, is now three, and so the Tour de France have already announced that they will be inviting three French teams, they being Total Direct Energy, B&B Hotels, and Arkea Samsic. Meanwhile, it was reported last week that Adi Duzer could become the next men's world tour team to have a women's team alongside it. Uh, speaking to Le Dauphiné, team manager Vincent Lavenu said that the thought had been there for quite a few years at this point, but that they would need a new backer. By the sounds of it though, that new backer may be imminent, as Lavenu was hopeful of being able to give some very good news in the next few months. Fingers crossed for that one. Right then, uh, time now for an update on the Movistar E-Team Challenge. Now this, if you didn't watch the show a couple of weeks ago, is where hundreds of riders will be whittled down to just six men and six women who will then form Movistar's new e-racing roster. 
So, the first qualifier round took place last Thursday with almost 5,000 riders competing over a 38 km course on the Ocean Lava cliffside route. So here are the list of riders who will now progress onto round one along with the pre-selected riders. Strong showing, you've got to say, from the USA on the men's side who accounted for half the qualifiers there, whilst among the female qualifiers were Imogen Cotter, an Irish professional rider who already competed at the Tour of Flanders last year in 2020. So a very high standard overall then. Uh, we'll finish though the racing news show this week with some more cyclocross because Saturday saw the conclusion of the Super Prestige series which took place in Middlekirke. Uh, just a couple of points separated Ellie Isabet and Tone Arts at the start of that day which made for quite a strategic race. Powell's Sousen Bingo going on the offensive to capitalise on a bad first lap for Arts. He would then recover though, thanks in part to some help from his teammate Lars van der Haar, who was instructed to wait in the closing laps just to make sure of that overall win. Up front, Lawrence Swake took an emotional win, dedicating that to his father-in-law, who'd passed away recently. It was a great day all round, in fact, for Balois Trek Lions, who also sealed the overall classification in the Women's Super Prestige 2 with Lucinda Brandt. Uh, meanwhile, snow on Sunday in Lille made for some very tough conditions for the riders at the X20 Badcomers Trophy. Uh, the women's race was an absolute corker, so Sanakart looked back to her best for much of the race, but then a slow puncture over the course of the final lap gave Brunt and Salin Alvarado the opportunity to attack. And after one of the longest shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder sprints you are ever likely to see in your life, it was eventually Alvarado who got her hands in the air. Not all bad for Brandt though, because she did increase her lead in the overall standings, with just the final round of that particular series still to go. Uh, that is coming up this weekend in Brussels, so you'll be able to watch that on GCN+. Meanwhile, in the men's race yesterday, Lawrence Swake doubled up with another win after attacking early and putting in a nearly faultless performance for the entire hour of the race. Right then, it's quite a long one that, wasn't it? I hope you stuck with us two to the end. Uh, that is all for this week's racing news show. Make sure you do not miss the Tour de la Provence, which starts on Thursday and continues through to Sunday because it's going to be a cracking race. And also tomorrow's GCN show, where we're talking about our most expensive cycling mistakes. See you then.